Welcome to our 1230 press event. This is a media availability um, with uh, researchers from the Voyager mission. Uh, NASA JPL had a, a teleconference at 11 a.m. Um, with these scientists and their colleague, um, Tom Krimigis. And Tom, are you there on the line? I am, but I can't hear you very well. You can't hear me very well. Okay. No. Hold on. You sound very weak. I'm feeling weak today. <laughs> okay, can you hear me better? No, no. Uh, yeah. You sound... Can you hear me, Tom? Very, very distant. Tom, can you hear me? This is Ed. I can hear you, Ed, but it's, it's very, very uh, weak. Okay, they're working on it. Okay, te we're testing again with you, Tom. Can you hear me? Okay, now it's getting better. Okay, testing. Okay. Testing, can you hear me? Yes, I can. There is a certain uh, echo, but other than that, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, all right, so I think we'll go with this. Okay, so um, just before we get started, I just wanted to let you know there are images available uh, to go with the findings that uh, the scientists here are going to discuss. Um, the URL for that is, um, is it go? Go.nasa. Go yeah. Okay. It's go, G-O dot NASA dot gov forward slash, and this is all in, uh, the first two are part, parts are in caps, N-A-S-A -A hyphen A-G-U, that part's all in caps, hyphen Voyager. And that's just written out, capital V-O-Y-A-G-E-R. And um, there, the teleconference, when uh, JPL streams their teleconferences, they include visuals. Um, so there's audio and visuals. And it goes out on their Ustream. So you can, you can replay that if you wish at www.ustream.tv forward slash NASA JPL2. And all those are in lowercase. OK, so we'll get started now. We have Ed Stone, Voyager project scientist with uh, Caltech in Pasadena. We have Leonard Berlaga. He's the Voyager Magno magnetometer team scientist. He's with NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And we have Tom Krimigis. He's Voyager low energy charge particle instrument principal investigator with Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab in Laurel, Maryland, and uh, we're reaching him today by phone in Greece. So um, uh, are we just going to have you, are you guys going to give some remarks? Yes, I'm going to just sort of introduce the subject and then we'll take Q&A. Okay, so Ed Stone will, will lead off with speaking now. Thank you. Well, uh, welcome. This is another exciting milestone in Voyager's mission of discovery, another surprise. Um, we've discovered a magnetic highway uh, which connects us to the outside so that the particles inside escape along this highway and at the same time the cosmic ray particles that are outside uh, can stream in along this magnetic highway. The, uh, you know, the heliosphere is a huge bubble the sun creates around itself. A million mile per hour solar wind creates this bubble and the two voyagers are on their way out of the bubble. Outside the bubble uh, is material that was created by the explosion of uh, supernovae uh, millions of years ago, 5, 10, 15 million years ago, and that's the material outside. Uh, inside the material is mainly uh, from our sun, and the wind is blowing outward from our sun, and the magnetic field is coming outward from our sun. Uh, this has been a 35-year journey so far. Today, Voyager 1 is about 122 astronomical units. The Earth's at 1 from the sun. Voyager is 122, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2 is 100 astronomical units, 100 times as far from the Earth, from the Sun as the Earth is. Uh, and 11 billion miles and 9 billion miles, if you want it in miles. There are three key indicators that be, we've been looking for to tell us that we have left the bubble and entered interstellar space to be surrounded by this other material. 
Uh, one is the intensity of the high energy cosmic rays, which are moving at half the speed of light, which were created by these same supernovae outside. And they're outside, and the slower, uh, some of those get clear into 1AU, they were discovered 100 years ago, but the slower ones, maybe only 20 or 30 percent the speed of light, cannot get inside the bubble. And, and we have no idea until we get out uh, we, how much is out there. Uh, they just can't get in. So that's one in question. Did the so-called galactic cosmic rays increase uh, as we, um, is that, a, that, that would be one signature that we're out. Another signature would be the low energy particles, the same ones that move with a few percent of speed of light are actually created or accelerated within the heliosphere itself. And we have seen the steady intensity of these ever since we crossed the termination shock uh, seven years ago. Uh, and so uh, the, once we get into interstellar space, those particles should stream away into the void of space. So we should see a drop in the low energy, slow particles at the same time that there is an increase of the higher energy, faster particles coming from outside in. That's two of the three. The third uh, 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 key thing we're looking for, key indicator, is the magnetic field itself. Inside the heliosphere, the magnetic field is from the sun, uh, and because the sun is rotating, the magnetic field is wound into a huge, giant spiral. And so because the field is wrapped into this spiral around the solar system, the field is east-west, and that's the way it's been basically ever since we launched. Uh, and we expect outside, based on other data, that the field outside which is really the result of these explosions which have picked up the magnetic field and oriented it more in a north-south direction. But of course it's all kind of compressed as it approaches the heliosphere, which makes it well, challenging to know how much change in direction there should be. But it would be quite remarkable if the field outside, which came from all these other stars, actually exactly matched in direction the field inside, which comes from our sun. So uh, we have three instruments, the cosmic ray instrument, which I, uh, I'm the principal investigator for, which measures the faster particles, some of which are inside leaking out, and the even faster ones which are outside coming in. Um, the low energy charge particle instrument, which in addition to those, can measure things which move a few percent the speed of light, which are, uh, which are created inside the heliosphere. And, uh, and Tom Kermegis is the PI for that and uh, the magnetometer that Len Berlaga is a co-investigator on. Those are the three key instruments. Uh, and the thing which, uh, uh, sorry, so those are the three, uh, three features that we were looking for, three key indicators, and we came, became very excited uh, on July 28th of this year when suddenly the particles inside dropped to half. They had never been that low since we crossed the termination shock in seven years. Suddenly, in one day, they were half. But in five days altogether, it came back. We were sort of went, touched it, and then it receded from the spacecraft. Uh, then again on August 13, another rapid decrease. This time, two thirds of the particles inside went away. But we were in that for about a week, and suddenly it moved away from us again. The boundary moved out again. And finally, on August 25th, uh, the intensity dropped to 90% only of 10% of what we had in the inside and has in sense uh, effectively now been uh, decaying uh, away. And we'll hear more uh, basically at the lowest energies that are made, uh, measured by the low energy charged particle instrument, they're a factor of a thousand now. Uh, and that's only an upper limit in some cases. They're not measurable. They have just basically gone off into interstellar space. So, and at the same time, the galactic, the cosmic rays outside were jumping up in each of these events. When the first dropout occurred, the cosmic ray intensity went up, then that went back down. Next dropout occurred, it went back up again and went back down. And finally, when this last change, when we finally got onto the highway uh, permanently, uh, the galactic cosmic rays jumped up and have basically been a steady intensity uh, since that time. So we're, we, we have somehow gotten onto this highway, which is the solar magnetic field, but it's connected somehow outside to what's outside. And that means the inside particles can stream along the spiral and be gone. And the particles, cosmic rays outside, can come in along that same spiral. And we may be, in fact, now seeing for the first time the intensity of what's outside, even though we're not outside. Why are we saying we're not outside? Because we, 
looked at the magnetic field, Len, Berla uh, Len Berlaga reported on that, where measured as accurately, it's a very strong magnetic. First of all, every time one of these particles were leaving, the magnetic field went up 60 percent. And then it went back down to what it had been. And then the next time the particles dropped away, the magnetic field went back up and dropped back down. And finally, on August 25th, it went up 60 percent and stayed up. And it's been that strong ever since. But the accurate measurements of the, direct, of the direction of the magnetic field did not change to within a few degrees. Immeasurable change in direction. And so we have no evidence that we actually have gone outside, only that we're in a compressed region where the field is piled up. As the particles left, the field could pile up and become more intense and became the main pressure that kept this big bubble inflated, if you like, was now uh, in this layer, outer layer. Uh, we also determined that the magnetic field we're seeing in this layer actually came from the southern hemisphere of the sun. Voyager 1 is at 35 degrees north, and the, and the, uh, the wind has been deflected and pushed up to the northern hemisphere, forming a layer on the very outer edges of the heliosphere right next to the heliopause, which is the boundary. And that field is, has come from the south polar region. So this is all, I mean, since we had not expected to find such a highway, uh, and, and, and we're now looking at the models to try, try to help us understand uh, what this highway means and why it's so well connected to the outside, but we are, uh, it's really quite a new area, uh, and it's a, it's a surprise, like one, so many things with Voyager, when we actually get there, we find out that our ideas were somewhat right, but in fact almost always incomplete, and this is one of those incompletes that we had in our ideas, that there was this uh, highway, and now what's ahead, of course, is how wide is, how far do we have to go to cross the highway and to actually get to interstellar space? Our models can't tell us exactly, but based on past experience, I would think it may be uh, two or three more years before we actually cross the highway. But as this new discovery illustrates, it could be something quite different again. Uh, we are just learning what it's like in the very outer reaches of our solar bubble on our way to interstellar space. So with that kind of as an outline, you'll find the graphics that go along with that, including some videos at the website that was mentioned. Uh, I think we're prepared to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Okay, do we have questions here from the floor? And you can address it to any one of us. That's, uh, even though I've done all the talking, uh, if it's a magnet, you know, be, feel free to ask any, anyone a question. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for the overview. Um, so uh, let me just get this straight. The, the uh, definition of the boundary of the solar system is where the magnetic influence of the sun ends? How, how would you, what's a simple way to define what the end of the, uh, the solar system is? Based well, on we, I call it the edge of interstellar space. I mean, the solar system, in a certain sense, the comets go even further out than that. So this is the edge of interstellar space. And that, that is the region where we pass from being immersed in solar wind that came from the sun, the magnetic field came from the sun, immersed instead in, this, in wind that has come from these exploding stars, carrying along with it the interstellar magnetic field. So it's a, it's a totally different environment, and they don't mix very much at that boundary. They sort of run past each other. Is that, is that accepted as, as the definition? For yes, that's accepted as a definition of the edge of interstellar space. But when we get there, we'll, we may find our that it may be more complex than the simple picture I created for you. There may be a lot of turbulence at the boundary. That's what we'll learn when we get there. Harvey's got a question. Okay. Harvey Leifert, uh, Freelance. Uh, something you just said, Dr. Stone, um, intrigued me, that the comets go out even further. Uh, I hadn't realized that. So they're crossing this boundary all the time? Without uh, well, yes. So it, there, there's a so-called so Oort cloud, mm -hmm. which is the source of the uh, comets that occasionally appear and come in very fast. Uh, that's maybe that's 10,000 astronomical units. That's high, that, that cloud extends halfway to the next star. So in a certain sense, that part of the solar system is in interstellar space, right? But most of the stuff we know is inside the bubble. But there are some parts which are actually in interstellar space. And they're orbiting the sun. But they're they orbiting the sun very loosely because they're so far out, but they're out there and occasionally get perturbed and fall into the sun. Well, is there some 
way you can tell when a particular comet crosses that boundary? I mean, I realize it's a moving boundary. It's a moving boundary, but in fact, this is a better vacuum than anything here on Earth. So it's really, it, it will not have much effect on anything uh, like a comet. As it'll come through the heliopause in, and it's basically still in a very, very good vacuum. It's just not a total vacuum. There is, on a scale that we are observing, there are particles, there are ions, there is a magnetic field. Okay, we have a question from the internet. This question is from uh, Leo Enright at Irish TV. He says, it's great to see the Voyager team back in the spotlight. <laughs> Are there any audio products from these observations, like the one the great Fred's scarf created long ago? Uh, yes, uh, we do have an instrument on Voyager called the Plasma Wave Instrument, which was the one that produced the uh, sounds. Uh, and uh, uh, there have been no plasma waves, that those are really waves in the plasma, and also radio, low frequency radio waves of a few kilohertz. Uh, we know that there's a region outside in interstellar space where those kilohertz radio waves are generated uh, because we've detected them inside the heliosphere with this instrument, but we have not detected any plasma waves so far in this region. Uh, but stay tuned. Okay, do we have other questions? And media, please identify yourself and your media affiliation. Hi, uh, Boston Hunt, Trouw Daily Newspaper, The Netherlands, and Cosmos Magazine, Australia. Um, I'm a bit confused about um, the terminology of a, of a highway. Uh, should I take that as a, a, a local weak spot in this, uh, in this bubble where things stream in and out and where Voy the Voyager uh, just happens to be? Um, no, it's a layer. We, we think it's a layer, the outer layer of the heliosphere, which, as I say, was carried up from the southern hemisphere. So the magnetic field lines in this layer act like a highway, allowing the particles to stream out along the magnetic field, the spiral field of the sun, and to also uh, come in along the spiral field inward of the, from the outside. So, so if you, uh, is it, would it be possible for you to describe the, the edge of the... Uh, of interstellar space in, in, in layer terms then, which, which would make maybe more sense for me. Uh, well, the spiral... Is, is there a succession of different layers? Well, we don't know. We this layer we had not anticipated. Uh, oh. This is all exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, but one, one idea is that this spiral, the field inside is still east-west because it's part of this giant spiral that circles around the solar system and that eventually we'll get outside and the field will be like that because it will be interstellar field, not solar field. And we, we didn't see it change direction. We see the same direction. So we now believe that it's most likely we're still in the solar field inside the bubble, which is a field that runs as musically in a big circle or spiral around the sun. So the field doesn't really change. The field so should change. We think but, but, it should. But it, but it hasn't yet. has not changed direction. So only it strength. a highway. Yeah, so that's the reason we say this is a highway, because the particles act like we're connected to the outside, but we're not outside. So if the field doesn't change, what makes the, what makes the particles uh, suddenly behave differently? Well, I think what makes it is something that's happening out on the end of the field line, out where they get to interstellar space. There's got to be some connection going on out there on these field lines we're on now, which was not happening on the field lines closer to the sun. The field lines wrapped around, so the outermost field lines are the ones that connect outside, because the others are all inside of that field line. It's a spiral. Do we have additional questions? Going once. <laughs> and let's see, do we have any from the chat? Here, there's a question. Ah, okay. Hold on just a sec. Oh, Roger Miller, Freelance. Um, sorry if you, you may have already answered this question, but I'm just wondering how long will we still be hearing from Voyager? Oh. How long will we be able to still get signals? We have a, the, the power, electrical power is provided by the natural radioactive decay of plutonium-238, which has an 88-year half-life. So uh, we lose about four watts of capability every year as the, as the power source decays away. Uh, so we can predict that if nothing fails on the spacecraft, we will ha we will, the power will, will get down to the point by 2020, we'll have to turn off our first science instrument. And by 2025, we'll be turning off the last one. 
uh, and that's on both spacecraft, roughly speaking. So if nothing breaks, uh, we will continue tracking them, and they transmit 24 hours a day, and we listen to them every day uh, as, as we, that's where this data comes from, and some of it is on the web. Some of these things I've described to you, they're in real time on the web as things are changing. Do we have any other questions? No one else? Okay, um, well, Dr. Stone and Dr. Berlaga and Dr. Kumages, thank you very much for um, all participating in this media availability. And um, we'll, we'll call it closed here then. At 1.30 we have another press conference about the Pineapple Express. So we'll welcome you back then. <laughs>